Education Council, the CEC, which sponsors the bucket courses. We're delighted to see you all here this morning. You have repeatedly asked to have Mike Gunther return to do a course for you. And even though he's an active faculty member at the college, uh, we, uh, he made time in his schedule for uh, teaching the bucket courses. You know, one thing we have found is that when the professor comes to do a course, uh, they are more than willing to come back again. And you deserve the credit for that. Thank you for behaving yourselves. <laughs> you know, in almost five years that we've done the bucket courses, we haven't had anybody sent to the principal's office yet. <laughs> Although we do have a contender or two. <laughs> uh, so this morning is our first class of a four class course on science and so society from Newton to Darwin by Assistant Professor of History at Grinnell College, Mike Gunther. Please welcome him back warmly. Thank you so much, for it. I really appreciate it. I really am excited to be back here and I appreciate the invitation. Um, let me just say a quick word for those of you that weren't here last week or maybe you just saw the title just about what we're gonna be doing over the four weeks here. Um, this is modeled in many ways on a class that I teach on campus and my own research, which is on the social history of science. So it's looking at science, um, how it's shaped by social values and practices. Scientists are people, and so they're very much, in important ways, reflect the values of their time. They draw on the strengths of their societies and the weaknesses. And so we're looking at how society shapes science, and then in turn, how science creates powerful techniques and tools and new forms of knowledge which can transform utterly society over time. So we're looking at that interplay, how science and society kind of shape each other. And so the way that I do that in class and the way to give it some organization is to focus on four kind of stories, four avenues by which science and society have really interacted, um, four techniques that are at the heart of modern science after the scientific revolution in the 17th century. So that'll be experimentation, what we'll talk about today. Um, quantification, where science is uh, techniques of measuring the world, and turning the world into numbers. Uh, no, the third one will be classification. And the fourth one will be visualization. So yeah. scientists yeah, but I don't know what that is. Okay. picture the world. I'll keep uh, a lot of scientists think visual, so we'll talk about that. All right, that's what I was wondering. Um, so today's topic, um, experimentation here. And I, the title I chose for today, The Experimental Way of Life, is kind of intentional. I think one of the things that's fascinating when you read the texts from the 17th century, from the beginning of the scientific revolution, is how much people thought, not only in terms of intellectual method, but that there had to be a complete change in the way of life for academics or for intellectuals. That they had to change where knowledge was produced, you had to move out of universities and colleges, you had to create entirely new ways of discussing knowledge of people, new language practices, new values, just a complete revolution in how you would think about the intellectual life. And they held it up as a model for society. Scientists by the end of the 17th century said, we know how to behave better than other people. Draw the theme of Joanne. We know how to get really smart people in a room together and collaborate without arguing with each other. We know how to make people productive. We know how to create trust um, and to work together. And these were things that were sort of Solomon's house. Named after King Solomon, kind of wisest of kings in the Old Testament. Um, and this is an institution that basically kind of runs society. It's a little bit segregated from society. It's filled with scientists that are organized by committees. Each of them have assigned a different laboratory where they experiment on things. So this is showing the sound house, where they're experimenting with discovering the properties of sound. They're studying musical instruments, echo chambers, conducting all kinds of experiments to discover how sound is propagated. And then a key Bacon type move, a Baconian move, um, this knowledge is going to produce useful discoveries. That's another thing that we often associate with Bacon, uh, is that knowledge should be useful. It should lead to discoveries and innovations. And so in the text, he's always talking about how the, the sound house, the optics house up here, the, up at the very top is the machine house, or the, I think it's called the engine house in the piece. But each of these, uh, the visitor to the island takes a tour around around the scientific community and, and visits each house, the medicine house and whatnot. And it's this vision of teams of scientists collaborating together, 
systematically funded by society, systematically spending their entire lives just doing experiment after experiment here. And then he also develops an interesting twist about hierarchy of knowledge within the society so that you have the people who do lab experiments, but then you have another committee that reads the results and decides what's most fruitful to go forward. Um, another committee that is charged with just finding out what discoveries or inventions could be drawn from the experiment. So it kind of talks about how it's not enough just to kind of play with machines and toys and do experiments, but you have to systematically figure out how to um, exploit experimental knowledge um, to decide what you should do next, what avenues are fruitful, kind of like the NSF today, you know, deciding what to fund, what not to fund here. Um, and so, like I said, the piece was short. It really captured the imagination because it hit on two things that fascinated people in the early 17th century, voyages of discovery and explorer tales on the one hand, um, and then this new world of science that many of them had never really heard or seen about. Um, maybe they you know, heard little snippets about what was being done in certain laboratories in different places. But this was a vision about what would society look like if science were at the heart of it, if science were kind of running the society. And there's really interesting things as well that one could talk about as far as um, how it shapes the social values of the society, how everyone is collaborative, everyone, no one is stuck in their ways or stuck in their ideas because at the heart of experimentation is you have to be flexible and open um, to any ideas, um, to any discoveries. And so there's a sense in which yeah, it shapes the actual values of people. Um, so like I said, Boyle, I mean, sorry, Bacon was really important to in some ways, putting the idea of experimentation on the agenda of Europeans. Um, but he did that in a fictional way. He, like I said, in his lifetime, he never really got to see it embodied in any practical living things. And so if you move forward the story, really the next place to, to, to move to would be Robert Boyle, um, an English chemist, physicist, son of an earl. Um, he had the wealth, and he was inspired by Bacon's idea, the drive to kind of finally put Bacon's vision into practice. And what I wanted to talk about, you know, for maybe until break, um, is the battle that he engaged with, with another famous philosopher, I'm sure some of you have heard of Thomas Hobbes, um, a famous kind of political philosopher here. And you might wonder, what is Thomas Hobbes doing in a story about science and about experiments? But he made it part of his later life's work to try to kill the world of experiments in certain ways. He thought it was a dangerous avenue, um, for a lot of reasons that I'll talk about. And he had a lot of political and intellectual weight in England in the 17th century. So I think it's important to remember that, although today it's hard to imagine why you would not do experiments, it's more hard to imagine science divorced of experiments. In the 17th century, there's a real question whether it was a good thing or not. And it was a real debate that people paid attention to here. So we have these two protagonists. And as I've mentioned uh, a couple times before, to me, science has a lot of drama that sometimes gets written out of the textbook. If you read a textbook on science, it will often be Boyle's Law. Pressure is inversely related to volume in terms of gases. And it's just a little equation with three letters, and you're told that Boyle discovered it in the mid-17th century. You're not told about the huge controversy, the turmoil, all the work that went into discovering it, and all the kind of drama. So we'll try to, I'll try to capture that today, make pneumatics exciting here, the way it was for contemporary. So what did Boyle do that was so exciting slash inflammatory to people of his age? Um, he built an air pump, which seems a little simple by today's standards. This is, we don't have Boyle's original, but this is a re reconstruction that was done about 70 years later that sits in the Science Museum in London. Yeah. It doesn't look particularly impressive probably by today's standards, but I remember once uh, a colleague of mine described it as the cyclotron of the 17th century, <laughs> the particle collider, right? It was an expensive, um, highly technical item to make. It cost about 30 pounds, if I remember make it, which would be over the salary of a clergyman or lawyer of the time period. So, you know, I guess today you could translate that into tens of thousands of dollars. Um, so not quite the cyclotron, but no one had built this thing. It took months and months to build. It took a lot of special craftsmen. Robert Boyle, the son of an earl, had to spend a lot of time in artisanal shops working with glass blowers. This, when you try to suck all the air out of the device, which is at the heart of this air pump, the idea is that you have these cranks here and a series of pumps, and as you crank it, you're slowly sucking all the air out. Glass tends to want to implode in that kind of situation, so it took a lot of work to figure out how to build a glass globe this big, how to create airtight pumps, how to make all of this, um, all of the pieces here. And as we'll see in a little bit, it's actually 
quite a clever device because it has this giant glass globe so that you can do experiments inside of it. So the idea is that you suck the air out, create a potential vacuum, and then you have a little, a special space that doesn't exist anywhere on Earth, kind of a special vacuum where you can conduct scientific experiments, probe nature in a way that you couldn't do anywhere else. So that, I think, is what is most startling about people. It's a device never seen before that allows you to do what does not exist normally in nature. Um, and there's only one of them, Robert Boyle, creates it and does a series of experiments, and I'll talk about some of the experiments, how he, um, how he explains them to people. Uh, I just wanted to point out that I, I find this always amazing. You can't go anywhere in the 17th and 18th century without seeing images of the air pump, because it did become the single most powerful icon of what experimental science meant. So I've seen it on, I don't have images of it, but I've seen it on tapestries. I've seen it on spellers that little girls would, um, you know, sew like a speller. Um, is that the right term? That's a sampler. Yeah, 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 not a speller, right? It's a sampler, yeah. It's a sampler. You can tell that this, I'm moving out of my area of expertise. Yeah. So the sampler, um, you'll see air pumps sewn into samplers. You'll see them in almost every engraving of science. Um, this is why I just wanted to show as an example, it's my favorite. It's a celestial globe, and if you zoom in, you'll see this picture of the air pump right here. So it became, like I said, iconic. If you want to understand experimental science, what's new, what's exciting, or if you're Hobbes, what's um, potentially troubling about it, the air pump is the place to go. Um, part of what I'm going to explain, too, is why I'm not going to talk about Newton today, even though the class starts with Newton that much. Oil and the air pump really are the moment in which experimental science takes off. So just a word about what, why does he want to create a vacuum? Why does he want to spend all this time and effort and money to create a pump? It had to go do with one of the most divisive issues in the old philosophy and the debates of the 16th and 17th century, which is can you have a vacuum in nature? Um, and so there was an individual, a, a student of Galileo named Torricelli, um, who when he was working, because Galileo, like Bacon, also suggested to people that you go hang out with craftsmen, go hang out with workers. And so Galileo and Torricelli used to spend time at the arsenal in Venice with craftsmen, people building boats, workers. And they would tell them, you know, you can't raise water more than 33 feet. It can't be done with a pump. Don't know why, but it just stops at 33 feet. And so what's above that space of the water, how that has to do with a vacuum, people didn't really understand. And so Torricelli kind of wanted to study it. He thought, well, 33 feet, that's kind of high. Um, why don't I use a much denser liquid? use mercury, which is 14 times denser than water. Let me see how high that stands up. So it ends up standing like 76 centimeters, which is the exact ratio um, that water stands up. So if you take water, you take 76 centimeters times 14, we get 33 feet. So he's discovering that there's a strange, there's a strange regularity beneath the pattern of nature. that You can't raise liquids above a certain amount. And so he, he tries this experiment, which creates what today we would probably call the barometer. Right? He takes a closed, um, I can see here. yeah, I have a modern day illustration just to make it clearer. <coughs> clearer. He takes a closed glass tube, it's closed on one end, open on the other, fills it with mercury, uh, puts his finger over the top here, and then turns it upside down into the bowl of water with his finger still on it, then releases it here. This is not a good idea to play with mercury, obviously, <laughs> that's very standard. Um, but it, there are a lot of scientific hazards. Um, people did, you know, I mentioned that scholastics didn't like to get their hands dirty. There was a lot of using of heavy chemicals, things like that. Um, uh, and it added a mystique also to the world of scientists, because these guys hung out in coffee shops and their own little private laboratories, and people were wondering what they were doing with all these substances. But, so they, anyway, you, you put the uh, glass tube upside down into the mercury, and you would expect the liquid to come all the way down, right? You, you just assume it would come down. But it doesn't. It stands still. It stands firm. And as I was saying, depending on what the pressure is out of your altitude, there's different things that we know today. But it seemed to stand at a, at a set height all the time. Most importantly, people wondered, what is this space up here? What could be in it, right? If you, have, if you fill the whole tube with mercury, you inserted it in a bath of mercury, there could be no air in the tube. What could there? And so this actually created this philosophical debate that tied into this issue of whether or not you could have a, a vacuum in nature. And it, just to be very kind of brief, I think the most important thing to know is that under the old Aristotelian or scholastic philosophy, people attributed intentions, and uh, they attributed intentions to nature itself. So you assume why does a rock fall to the ground? It's 
because it has a principle of heaviness. It literally desires to be at the center of the earth. The rock has an intention to want to move there. And it seems sometimes when I talk about this with students, it seems a little silly today. Although in biology, it makes a lot more sense to talk about an acorn wanting to be an oak tree in the sense that it has a purposeful evolution, what the Greeks would call a teleology, a telos. It has an end, and it wants to move to that end. That explanation actually makes a lot of sense in certain forms of life science or biology. But the Aristotelians applied it to all categories here. Um, and at the heart of it, if, if I were an Aristotelian, I wanted to explain why is there a space, why is this liquid standing up, seeming to defy the normal thing, which is wanting to move down to the surface of the earth. I would say that nature abhors a vacuum so much, it's so much against the principle of nature for there to be a vacuum, that this water is straining to rise up to prevent there from being a vacuum. So this was this Latin term that they called the hori vacuum. Nature abhors a vacuum. So, so that was the explanation. It was this philosophical thing that was tied into views about what is the fundamental purpose of nature? What is the fundamental purpose of different types of matter? Um, and it was an elaborate, articulate way of explaining nature. But it was one that people like Robert Boyle and all the new scientists just could not understand. And they wanted to disprove it. They wanted to replace it with mechanical explanations here. And so Torricelli seized upon this seeming, you know, I think Hobbes once called this a part of it. A parlor trip. That it basically, it's an interesting little experiment, a little kind of um, weird absurd, uh, oddity of nature. But um, Torricelli and, and people after him seized upon it and said, no, this is actually exactly what we should be doing. Let's start experimenting with these tubes. And so here's an example in Germany where they start creating larger ones and have this giant vat of mercury. And they start experimenting, um, measuring it, seeing when it goes up and down. Uh, at the heart of it, too, and I want to talk about uh, Pascal. Um, what Torricelli and some of the scientists start to do as they study it is they start to imagine, well, what if instead of the idea that nature abhors a vacuum, that Mercury is trying to climb itself up the tube because it wants to prevent that, let's, let's develop a better explanation. What if air has weight? And what if the tube, air is pushing down on a pool of Mercury? And it's like a balance. So the air, its weight is pushing down, and that's pushing the liquid up. And that image of a balance was really important, because you always have to give people some kind of metaphor to explain things there. And so um, that was the kind of idea, but it sounded like an interesting idea, but how do you prove it? And this is where we get to what's interesting about experiments, and what starts to become something in the 17th century, which is designing the perfect experiment to disprove one theory and prove another. Here. Which is potentially a very powerful tool, because that's one of the things that always hobbled the old scholastic philosophy, which is it was very divisive. And people had different camps, and you could never, they never seemed to be able to convince the other side that they were wrong. You could always develop more logic, more reason, but you could never convince people. Here. And so that's one of the things that's most attractive about experiments to scientists in the 17th century. What if you could create the perfect experiment that would totally settle the issue? And so I'd say that. Arguably, the first time that happens, um, at least for some, is with Blaise Pascal. So he says, okay, let's imagine that we have air that's weighing on one side of the balance, and we have mercury or water, whatever liquid on the other, that's what's holding it up. If I want to make this really work, I've got to explain that when I change the weight of air, that I change the height of the column, right? If I can show that I can change the actual height of the column in a controlled manner by changing the weight of air, then I can explain my theory. Right? I have proof of my theory. So how do you do that? How do you change the weight of air? So he convinced a very, um, very helpful cousin of his to climb up this mountain um, in France, which is 4,000, I think meters, I'm trying to remember if it's meters or feet, the Poire de Dome. Uh, it's this volcanic, it's one of the highest parts of France. It sits in the Mastiff mountain range. Uh, and Pascal was thinking, well, if we're sitting at the bottom of an ocean of air, and it's all that accumulated weight of air that's pushing down, making Mercury rise. Well, what if I climbed up to the highest point in France? I'd be much higher up, and the pressure should, uh, not sorry, pressure, the weight should be much lower at that point. Right? And so he convinced his uh, brother or cousin to go up there and do that. And there's, this was a, another kind of famous moment that there, this was a painting done a little bit later, but there were all these painting and images of Pascal's um, cousin up at the top of the mountain. And sure enough, and Pascal predicted, he tried to predict what would, how much would it go down based on the different weight of he was pretty close to the mountain. And he had asked a monk at the base of the mountain at the exact same time to be having another one of these Torricelli 
too. So it's kind of like having two barometers, one at the top of the mountain, mountain one at the bottom. And sure enough, it did not um, rise nearly as high. As the weight of the air was lower there, the column of mercury lowered by about three centimeters, which is what it predicted. So it was this kind of key moment um, that seemed very promising for people here. And it led people like Robert Boyle to think, well, I don't want to climb up the mountain top, obviously. That's, that's kind of heroic here. Um, so, but it made people think, well, could we devise instruments that allow us to create, simulate what it's like to be on the mountaintop? Or most audacious of all, what if we could simulate what it would be like to climb out of the Earth, to be at the very top, on the edge of space where there's no air at all, no weight at all here. So that's what's behind this um, idea of the air pop here. This is the engraving that uh, Boyle has in his uh, list of experiments. Here. Uh, like I said, it's a little bit more detailed. You can see the breakdown mechanism of the cranks and the pumps. Um, it has several pieces that can be attached. The top, you can unscrew the top here so that you can dangle in different scientific experiments. Um, so let me just mention a couple of things you do. One of the things he would experiment was like the cohesion of marbles. How, how tall? I mean, how big is that? How tall? Is Good question. Yeah, so, yeah, because we don't have anyone standing next to these. And stuff. It would be about to about this height. So the globe itself is about this big. Um, they end up making ones that are much bigger later on. Uh, but the first one is, is, is pretty modest in size uh, because that's about the, as much as a glass blower could make a globe at that time period that could withstand the intense pressures. Um, and I should go and pinch, point out that the air pump can be put in reverse as well. You can condense air inside it and create a highly condensed environment. So what it would be like to be at the bottom of the ocean. You know, there's just intense pressure. So it depends on which way you crank it. There's um, a valve here that allows you to, you turn that on or off and you can either suck or blow air into the, to the receiver here. Like I said, at the top there's this screw valve that you can open up and let you um, dangle in different implements. Um, and they would do all kinds of interesting experiments that had previously been thought experiments, but now you could do in actual concrete form in front of people. So the new scientists had argued against Aristotle that um, all objects should fall at the same speed, regardless of how much they weigh. A feather should hit the ground at the same time as a coin, even though, or as a heavy weight. So that was one of the first experiments they were doing here. Once you don't have air, you have no air resistance, you can try. You can drop a feather, and uh, you don't want to drop too big of a weight, a glass thing. You can drop you know, a weight in there um, and see if they come at the same time. So there's all these kinds of things you can do that could not be done before. Yeah. How did they know there was a vacuum in there? How did they measure that? that is, that's a great question. That's one of the big philosophical debates. So the question is, how do you know that they actually don't have any air in there? That they've actually created a vacuum, right? Um, and so Hobbes and others say that they did not. Um, and even some people that were friendly to Boyle, uh, later on when they would try to make their own pumps, there were people who would build a pump, seem to totally evacuate the pump, and yet the barometer would not fall down. And so this was a real, this was probably the biggest Achilles heel in the world of experimental philosophy, which is what happens if you create experiments and other people can't replicate them or have different, or how do you know that a tool works um, if it's the only tool that does that? So there's this issue of kind of calibration. So the short answer is, is they start to develop tests. Boyle insists that a good air pump works if the mercury falls all the way down. Like if there's no air in the piece and the, and the barometer falls completely, that is itself a sign that it doesn't. Others use bladders. They inflate bladders. Um, and as the air pump goes down and it deflates, um, that can work. Uh, they use a manometer. They, uh, Robert Hooke invents another kind of mercury device. Uh, but each of these is some ways a leap of faith. And I think that's something important to, me to mention. That part of science is building trust, that you trust the instruments of other people and that, they're, that what they're doing is what they're doing. Here. And the quote, yeah, so, I, I don't know, that might not answer your question exactly, but, um, but yeah. So the, well, let me point out that Boyle, he conducts 40 experiments in his first time at the air pump after breaking a couple of receivers. Um, and like I said, there's some interesting ones about like, kind of marbles that cohere together. You can get marbles to stick together if they're very, very smooth. They kind of defy gravity. It was like, what would happen if yeah, there's no air pressure 
would they fall? You know, there's all these the experiments about will a feather and a heavy weight fall at the exact same time? Is there sound if there's no air? People have argued that sound is a way that it requires air, but that was an argument. No one had a way to prove it. And so they would put bells inside an air pump and try to hear if you could hear the bell or not. So there's all these different kinds of experiments being done um, throughout. The, the chief experiment was number 14, what Boyle called the void in the void, uh, which was him basically inserting a barometer into the pump to see. He wanted to, that was kind of the heart of it. I think I have an image of later on, they, this is from a catalog in the early 18th century, but they started creating these big glass extensions that you could put really large barometers into your um, air pump here. So you can see examples here. So, um, so Boyle inserts a barometer full of mercury or Torricelli tube into his um, receiver. He evacuates it, and it's heavy work actually. It's kind of interesting at the time we talk about how much pumping it takes. And if you try to pump like air out of uh, you know, a wine bottle or anything like that, it gets, it's hard work once you get to very little air. And so um, there's these, he describes them as stout men pumping all the time. <laughs> <laughs> this, this son of an earl, he's not actually going to do the heavy labor himself. So he's got, he's got his uh, helpers uh, doing that. But each time, each pump, each pump as it gets less and less air, the, the column of mercury descends accordingly. And so he takes this as kind of dramatic proof. His machine shows that it's, and, and I'll talk about what, what, uh, what he thinks he proved, yeah. I want to know what else he put in there, because if this was my experiment, marbles and bells would be cool, but Certainly a mouse would be the very first thing I put in there. Okay. So the question is, is what else did uh, Boyle put in his instrument? Um, one of the first things you might put in there uh, would be a mouse. Or Absolutely. Living in, yeah, right. So that is one of the things that they put in there. Uh, they put in a bird, um, and they watch it. I have an image later on, I'll show you a dramatic painting from 100 years later. That was a popular experiment uh, for public lectures or in homes, is to put an animal into the air pump and to prove um, so that's another potential way to prove that there's not air in there, um, in a kind of, yeah. I don't know, they wanted to, there was an attempt later on to build an air pump large enough to fit a human being in, uh, and not, not, not that they would have evacuated all the air, but they wanted to know about how pressure would change blood, like how the change in air pressure would change the organs, they just, the, I think what's important to know is that this is a new space where you can do all kinds of new activities. So it opens up lots of potential avenues to explore you know, um, in different ways. And yes, they do put animals in. And I, I should point out that um, I, I sometimes talk about this in my class on campus. I sometimes don't because of lack of time. But uh, Bacon often compared experiments to putting nature on the rack. Um, and there was a sense in which, and people point out that he was the Lord Chancellor of England. He was familiar with witchcraft trials and trials in general, and that sometimes the most Trustworthy evidence in the English legal system at the time was evidence given under torture or duress. And so there's a real debate among historians and philosophers about whether that's just a useful metaphor or whether there's a sense in which nature and the use of animals and others, the dissection. Most of my students and myself kind of cringe at the way animals were used in experiments or the way um, some experiments were done during that time period. So there is a, there is a debate going on about whether there's an not inherent cruelty, uh, but whether the idea that experiments are kind of torturing nature is, like I said, just a, a convenient metaphor of the time period that doesn't really matter, or whether it goes to the heart of the enterprise itself. Yeah, so some people have argued, there was a famous book called The Death of Nature, and the argument was is nature went from being something kind of quasi-spiritual, something that you had an intimate relationship to emotionally, personally, through magic, through um, superstition, all these things. And that's what, partly what science does is kind of kills that conception of nature and kind of subjects it to the probing, you know, kind of um, uh, manipulation of science. So yeah, I mean that's that is a debate, and that that is something that was used. In, it's not in this first set of experiments. I think it's the second set of experiments that he does later. That he puts an animal in here. But that's a good question. Um, so uh, let's see here. Yeah, let me just end on this last 
no, I think we have a, a couple minutes left. So Boyle conducts uh, these different experiments. And I just want to say a word about how he actually communicates that to people, which actually comes to these questions about you know, why would people believe that he's able to get air out of his pump? How do they know his pump doesn't leak? Um, how do they know that he's not conducting tricks? Because there's a large culture of um, kind of showmen throughout the Middle Ages and early modern periods that would have automated animals that would have all kinds of um, looking glasses that would make you see things um, upside down. There's all the different ways in which um, creating artificial environments is not necessarily discovering truth. It's just kind of tricking people themselves. Um, at the heart of it uh, was an entirely new way of communicating science. So one of the things that's really interesting about Boyle, um, as opposed to other scientists, even Pascal before him, is he insisted on being what he called prolix, wordy. Like he wrote long, detailed descriptions of every experiment. He told you what the weather was like, he told you who was doing the pump, he told you every detail about the environment, what the temperature was like that day. Um, he had to apologize for it. He says, I'm an Oxford trained gentleman. I know you're not supposed to write like this. There's no rhetoric, there's no um, artifice in my writing. I'm going to write to you with boring detail because you need to know all the detail to know that I actually did this experiment. Because uh, part of what is going on, actually, um, let me just show you. Part of what's going on in the early modern period is a lot of people are doing thought experiments. Um, they're saying, I'm not actually going to do this, but I imagine, so this is an image of Pascal. It's like, imagine that I, or he doesn't even say imagine, he's just like, take one of these Torricelli tubes and go to the bottom of a river, and you'll see this happens. And he has an engraving. And Boyle gets upset with this. He's like, you did not go to the bottom of the river. Um, and on one hand, that's a trivial difference. Pascal didn't understand why that would be a problem. He's like, my reasoning is sound. I'm just giving, experiment is nothing but an illustration of the truth. Boyle is arguing, no, experiment is sacrosanct. It creates facts. It's almost like a legal case, it's a deposition. It needs to be witnessed, it needs to be testified to. Boyle includes all the people and insists that people watch his experiments and he gives us their names so that we can know. Um, uh, and I was going to point out that even the diagrams themselves, like here's an example of an image from about 50 years earlier from a chemical text. You can see how different the drawings are. This was very expensive and very detailed to do, but this was meant to convey an authentic experience and an authentic instrument that exists in real life, whereas this is just kind of a symbolic illustration of take a furnace, take a pneumatic trough. You don't know what mine looks like. It doesn't matter. It's just a symbol. Device. This is like a blueprint almost. And all throughout his text, he's trying to make it so hyper realistic that anyone can conduct the experiment anywhere else in Europe. Or vice versa, that they know he did it, that he built this device, they know every intricate detail. So there's a sense in which he's communicating to the audience. Um, he even has it translated um, into English and other languages so people can read it. But he's trying to create what we would say would consider like a scientific report. It's detailed, it's accurate. Kind of testified to that. Where was his experiments done? What was the location of his lab? Uh, his sister's home in. Uh, oh yeah. So where are Boyle's? Where were Boyle's experiments done? Mm -hmm. uh, Boyle himself was always a bachelor, and so he lived with his sister, um, who married uh, an English aristocrat and had a house outside of England. I mean, outside of London, and so she built a kind of laboratory space for him. So some of them were conducted there for this book. Others were conducted at the Royal Society in front of a large audience later on, but they were originally done in his home. Um, and so yeah, uh, maybe we'll go ahead and end there. But, uh, so we'll end on this note about the detail, the realism, um, and I'll come back and talk about Hobbes, why he was so curious with this, and the enlightenment kind of later on. Thank you. Thank you for your speech, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, if you did not check in when you came, would you please stop at the registration desk before you leave this morning? And now we will continue with our first class of the four class course on science and society from Newton to Darwin with Professor Mike Gunther. Mike. voice adjusted here. Okay. If, if this ends up being too loud or too soft, maybe people can let me know. Oh. 
So let me just finish up with um, one or two more points, and then I'll move on. But about uh, the title of the slide, the new rules of experimental practice. I do think it's really interesting that Boyle's experiment and his style of writing became it did lay down rules for a new game, for a new way of reporting scientific knowledge. So I was mentioning about his prolex or something <coughs> called the circumstantial style of writing, where he intent, insisted that you give all the details, almost overwhelm your reader with details, because they need them in order to evaluate the particularities of the experiment. You need to provide witnesses that testify to the fact that you did them. Um, most interestingly, you need to separate fact from hypothesis. And this is another thing where Boyle represents an interesting departure. Boyle would have part of his text, long descriptions of the experiment, and then he insisted on separating in the text potential speculation about the causes of what he was witnessing in the experiment. So, put another way, he insisted that you draw a bright line between facts that are produced through experiments and your interpretation of those facts, or the building of a hypothesis. And that would be a really important line in science, and one that Boyle would insist was needed for the experimental community. For intellectual reasons, if you tie up facts and theory together, it makes it very hard for people to build and collaborate with each other if they don't share your theory. Um, but also for kind of moral and social reasons. That part of what he was trying to do was to bring down the level of debate and dissension. There were rival camps in natural philosophy. Cartesians were against other groups, um, against Gassinians, and there were all these different groups of rival interpretations. And he insisted that facts, if they're divorced from theory, all can agree on, all can collaborate, all can write about them, all can produce them. We don't have to have divisions and debates. We don't have to divide up into camps. So we thought that creating a science based on facts um, was more realistic and also, like I said, um, would produce a more cooperative, collaborative kind of enterprise. And there was kind of a social and even kind of a moral tone to that. Um, and then lastly, I just want to point out that there are things that he starts to develop out of these experiments that are interesting in terms of the science. So Pascal had said in Torricelli that it was the weight of the air. We live at the bottom of an ocean of air. So all of that collective air weighs down on us, and it pushes the pool of water and mercury at the base, and then you know, pushes it up that way. Boyle, by putting his experiment inside a glass tube, discounts that, because all that air can't weigh on the actual Torricelli tube, because it's enclosed in glass, right? It's separated. It's not, it's not being pushed on by three miles of air. It's got a glass separator. And so in his actual experiments, he starts to develop a different idea, which is air pressure, the idea that air wants to expand. He doesn't know how to explain it. He's very cautious about not developing what he considers a theory or a system. He just says, maybe the air is shaped like the springs of a coil, and it just kind of bounces. Maybe it's like a sheep's wool. It just has kind of natural elasticity. I can't tell you what causes air to have springiness, nor should I try to. Because if I try to, I try to do too much. One of Boyle's most famous metaphors was like observing a clock. You can watch the hands of a clock systematically. You can understand how they move. You can describe them. You might even be able to create a mathematical equation to explain how they move. But if you can't open that clock face, you have no idea what mechanisms drive the clock. And you shouldn't try to speculate about things of which you cannot know. And so this is a key moment in science, which is, again, we are going to, in some ways, lower the sites of science. Instead of trying to explain why everything happens, maybe we hope to sometimes get there, but we're going to explain how they happen. We're going to try to understand that rather than kind of get at causal factors. So, Boyle, so that's a kind of, like I said, it's an epistemological, it's also kind of a moral stance, like kind of um, know yourself, know your limitations. Um, and we're going to enforce this with new language codes, right? You don't talk about causal language, you have to be descriptive, you have to deal in matters of facts not in theories. And in fact, all throughout, from the 17th century on, if you say theory, metaphysics, or system, people will just hiss at you. <laughs> like Enlightenment people learn to, these are the kind of words by which a new culture defines itself against these things. It's not a culture of philosophy, of theory, of system building. These are, my favorite uh, metaphor is Robert Boyle once called himself a humble drudge. Right? Which is kind of very interesting coming from the son of an earl. He's basically saying, I'm just here to report facts and to spend my life collecting these things, writing very long reports to you about them, um, uh, 
uh, doing these things. Uh, and that's important in order to create a new kind of cooperative, collaborative community of scientists who can trust each other, who can work together. But let's be honest, I mean, philosophers and scientists, I mean, you can have big egos. It's not easy to get really smart people to work together, especially if they have different ideas and different theories. And they're invested in their theories, and they're training students who are invested in those theories. And so that was the cycle that Boyle and the experimentalists were trying to break. And experimental practices, the, the kind of convention of facts only, these were ways to break those kinds of cycles. Um, and so just to give it one more kind of example, to Pascal, Boyle was like, Pascal should not have done that. All experiments should be done by yourself. Another favorite phrase of his is, seeing is believing. Like, until I see something and do it myself, I should not believe it. Um, I should you know, not take the testimony of others. So people told him water went to 33 feet height, roughly, but he wanted to prove it. So on one of his Paul Mall houses in London, he had this giant tube built. Um, and then on top, I think five feet were made of glass. And so here's an artist's rendition um, of this here that was built there. But, and so he actually measured the exact amount. Um, and this would become kind of an important aspect. It, it's a little bit of tension, because I've been emphasizing that science is all about trust, but it's also about a certain amount of skepticism. I, I realize that those two things seem in opposition, but that's at the heart of what experimentalism is trying to foster, is to um, only believe those things that you yourself can witness, can uh, test, uh, but vice versa, creating a culture of facts in which we can all collaborate um, and work together. So let me talk about why Thomas Hobbes, why would you object to experimentation, right? Is Hobbes just a, a curmudgeon um, here? Uh, why, why would, you know, one of the brightest philosophers of England, and behind him are also some important figures, Descartes was always very ambivalent about experiments. I mean, there's all these quotations where he says, oh, it's not really worth the time with the money. An experiment is like drawing a good illustration. It just kind of proves a point. You don't actually have to do it. Um, and it's certainly not worth, like Robert Boyle, spending your life building these contraptions. And so there are a lot of important people who are kind of uh, questioning um, experiments. So one of the things that Hobbes says is that the senses are just unreliable. He gives you know, examples. You look at the sun, your eyes get burned, and all of a sudden you look around and you see dots everywhere. And that's kind of a layman's example. But he has dozens of examples where he gives where the senses aren't reliable, and he takes perverse pleasure in pointing out how these experimentalists have a hard time replicating their own experiments. So he says, like, you know, you, if you want to create universal assent, get people to agree things, you don't found it on the senses, because those are the most unreliable of things. Even law courts have a, um, problems uh, trusting the senses. And I should point out that there's an interesting overlap during this time period between <coughs> definitions of legal evidence and scientific evidence. Most of these people are, that are doing science or gentlemen will also serve in the legal profession or sit on juries. And there's a, there's a multiple, there's a conversation happening in multiple fields at this time period about how should you evaluate evidence here. Um, so science and the law have a really interesting overlaps. Um, another thing he says is that actually tied to this, experiments create more disputes, not less. They don't really resolve things here. He was in Paris when Pascal did his famous Coy de Dome experiments. And he saw Mersenne and other philosophers actually disagree with the results. Yeah, they didn't believe Pascal. And actually, in Paris during the 1640s, this was the most hot, the hottest topic was pneumatic experiments. And what is the void at Torricelli's top of his tube? And basically, Hobbes said that I didn't see any unity there. I just saw greater divisions here. And as I've kind of mentioned before, the first people that tried to replicate Boyle's experiments with air pumps got different results from him and started developing different theories. The most famous is there's a Dutch scientist, I'll talk about this a lot next week, Christopher uh, Huygens, and he built one of these things, and his pump, um, whenever he evacuated it, the, the mercury would not drop. Um, and we think today that has to do with something um, about uh, kind of static friction within tubes. I mean, there's a kind of modern-day scientific experiment, but Huygens took it as that he had discovered something that Boyle had missed. Boyle's pump didn't work, his pump did work. And that the reason it worked is because there's a the kind of special ether fluid that moves throughout the world that's at the top of his pump. And you only see it when you've actually evacuated all the... It, it's a very complicated explanation. It was embarrassing kind of for Boyle, because Boyle is telling everyone, you know, facts, experiments, these are the clearest way to reason, to discovery, to consensus. 
And the people that are actually conducting these experiments are going off with wild hypotheses about mechanical ethers and stuff. So, so Hobbes takes kind of delight in pointing out that. He also is really hits home on this issue that for students and for us today, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but in the 17th century, it was very touching, which is the dignity of philosophy. Um, if you look at the portraits of people like Boyle or Bacon, these are people that are dressed with um, kind of lace all over their hands, their coats, silk brocaded things. To call them, and Hobbes uh, would kind of always make fun of Boyle and others and call them ingenious, uh, which is a pun on the Latin word uh, for engine, because he's writing in Latin at the time. So another way to put it in today's parlance is that he always calls Boyle and others crafty. Right? Like crafty is not a positive thing. If I said, you know, you're, you're very crafty, right? Like as a scientist, that has a very kind of dubious connotation. In the same way, calling someone a genius in the 17th century was to say you're an engine man. You're like a mechanic. You work with. You're very clever with your little toys and your pneumatic pumps, things like that. But that's not the dignity of a philosopher. And this was a hot button issue because this was an important kind of thing. The new experimental science was saying. Actually, we want to change the very vision of what it means to be a philosopher, to live in an intellectual community. And at the heart of that, we're going to work with artisans and craftsmen. We're going to get our hands dirty. We're going to literally make new knowledge, and that's a good thing. Hobbes comes around and points out, in the culture of the time, how problematic that is, that kind of lowering oneself down to the level of mechanics or engineers. Um, and so that, I think Boyle being an Earl's son got a little bit of, um, uh, could have thicker skin. It could withstand that, but other people at the time, Christopher Wren, Robert Hooke, other people with more middling backgrounds, this hurt, this stung. Um, and it was one that contemporaries, especially those outside of science, might listen to. Is this really what we want our greatest philosophers to do? To like climb on top of an apartment with a big tube and measure things, you know, and have craftsmen build it? So, um, like I said, in our world, it doesn't make sense, but at that time, it's, um, it's a powerful um, social uh, kind of indictment. Uh, then this issue, Hobbes really, this is the most media intellectual issue. Hobbes says philosophy is about causes. If you can't explain why things happen, if you can't lay down an intelligent, coherent explanation about the causes of the world, you're not doing philosophy. Um, in fact, he would always refer to Boyle as a historian, which is a strange term. He means that someone who collects facts. That's very interesting. You're a natural historian. You collect a bunch of facts about your air pump and your marbles and Interesting enough, an animal dies when you suck the air out of the machine. But that's not doing philosophy. Um, and if you don't have a causal explanation, then you'll never command assent from people. Hobbes you know, like would say, like you, philosophy needs to be like geometry. No one can argue with geometry. It lays down the rules. A triangle has 180 degrees. It commands universal assent because it gives you impeccable logic. Um, here. So this is what Hobbes is saying. And this is a very touchy issue during the midst. This is all happening in the aftermath of the English Civil Wars, after 20 years of civil and sectarian strife. So, and Hobbes, if you know anything about Hobbes, some of you may or may not, he's known for his book, The Leviathan, which is that you can only have one authority in society and they must lay down the law. If you want to have peace, you have to have absolute authority and submission. And in important ways, he's saying the same thing in the realm of science. You've got to lay down the law with theory, logic, tools of kind of geometry here. And there are a lot of people listening to Hobbes. Uh, and it brings us to the last point, especially this idea. Um, Hobbes was purposely excluded from the Royal Society, which was the new scientific organization created to embody the views of Boyle and others to do experiments. And I'll talk about it in a second. They purposely excluded Hobbes. Um, and so he wrote all of these kind of fierce critiques from the outside. And there were other, other philosophers of the time one of the things that they pointed out that I think would also hit an Achilles heel of science was they pointed out that the Royal Society seemed like a kind of special clique. That in doing experimental knowledge that was reserved to a select few with the machines, the equipment, in their laboratories, they were creating a kind of um, specialized elite almost. And, and Hobbes hated lawyers for the same reason. Anyone who had their own language, had their own code, these were rival sources of authority and power. Like the law, science, religion, he didn't like the clergy either. These are all fields in which they should be public, and you know, open <coughs> philosophers appointed by the king should lay down the principles. You don't want specialized professions um, that act like guilds, kind of, that kind of cordon off knowledge 
for themselves and, like I said, are rival centers of authority and power. So, again, given the time period of the, the late 17th century, this was a potentially stunning, or it's a dangerous critique to be loved. Science had to deal with that. And it's not only in England that France had a series of civil wars called the Fronde. Um, often textbooks would often describe the 17th century as the age of crisis. Because all throughout Europe, there were a series of rebellions, civil wars, unrest in all types of ways. And so science is treading right during the middle of the most explosive period saying, we know how to create consent. We know how to create a community of collaborative people. We know how to get everyone to work together. Um, so that's going to be a really you know, intense political issue. And it was at the time. People talked about it in terms openly of politics. Um, here, Boyle, Hobbes, all of them saw the political resonance of what they were doing. So I'll just say briefly, and then I want to move on to the 18th century and to the Enlightenment. Um, but the Royal Society is an important kind of moment. Uh, it is an organization founded in 1660. Boyle takes a lead along with another small group of people in receiving a royal charter for this. It's designed um, as a new kind of institution. I said that this, the new science did not want to practice in universities and colleges that were run by scholastic philosophers. And the heart of the old university system was the disputatio. After you got a degree, uh, rather than particularly write a thesis, what you did is you had a public disputation. You basically argued with people. And, and part of the critique of the old, old philosophy was that that's what it did. It taught people to argue, to dispute, to cavail. Um, it taught people how to kind of intellectually kneecap other people. Um, kind of this, and that's the way they use it. They use different terms for kneecapping. But this idea that it's a kind of petty tools that are used solely to um, take down your opponent. And the argument is that that's not good for knowledge. It's also not good for politics to train a whole class of people who know how to argue this way. And so the argument is, is you need to get out of universities. We need a total change of life. And so we need to create societies, experimental societies that are based on no masters and students, no public disputations. Instead, we're going to get together as a collaborative group of gentlemen. They have speech and behavior codes. You're not allowed to address each other. You have to address the chair. When speaking, you have to take your hat off. You get fined if you speak about religion or politics in most of these societies. Um, so there's a sense that you have to create a new special environment in which to, um, in which to get people to work together. Let me just read a short quote. Um, probably the best source to talk about the new values of experimentalism in the Royal Society was this Bishop Thomas Spratt, who wrote this 400-page defense of the Royal Society. And it goes in great detail about why experimentalism will heal all the political and religious and social wounds of England. And I just love this quote that he has. In the winter meeting, he says, We behold an unusual sight to the English nation, that men of disagreeing parties and ways of life have forgotten to hate and have met in the unanimous advancement of the same works of experimental science. The soldier, the tradesman, the merchant, the scholar, the gentleman, the courtier, the divine, the Presbyterian, the papist, the independent, and those of orthodox judgment have laid aside their names of distinction and calmly conspired in a mutual agreement of experimental labors and desires. A blessing which seems even to have exceeded that evangelical promise that the lion and the lamb shall lie down together. Now, as always, scratch a little over the top, but I think that that vision is in such an appealing one to people in the 1660s. This vision of experimental science in its new spaces, with its new institutions, uh, with its new codes of how to talk to each other, how to behave. Um, that's so deeply desired um, in the 17th century world. And that's part of the reason why experimental science became really popular and really successful. I don't doubt that Boyle created better knowledge than Hobbes suggested. That, I'm not saying that, but I don't think you can discount the social factors. Part of the reason why Boyle won the time that he did, in ways that Galileo did not win when he went against the church. Part of the reason why Boyle and experimentalism succeeded is it addressed the deepest needs and desires of the social and political fabric um, at the late 17th century. So, um, now let me talk a little bit about it. Maybe this seems like a little bit of an awkward transition, but I want to talk a little bit about the 18th century, about how this science, this culture of experimentalism, becomes even more popular, how it goes beyond the confines of the Royal Society or other scientific societies of the time period. And let me give an image. I was talking earlier about the animal in a pump. This is a famous painting um, by uh, Joseph Wright, um, a painter from Derby, um, of a philosopher demonstrating the air pump. 
He also painted this one as well, which is a philosopher demonstrating the world. These are two really good images of the world of enlightenment science, um, which in ways that may or may not surprise you, I don't know, um, was intimately woven into the home, into public life. Uh, science was an integral part of everyday life in the 18th century. I want to talk a little bit about why it became that way, how it became that way. I don't think Boyle or any others, maybe not even Bacon would have predicted how much ordinary people became involved in scientific demonstrations, experiments, and the like. Um, this one, I think, is particularly compelling just because of the drama of the piece, getting at this theme that I was going to talk about a little bit. You see the children kind of looking away. Actually, everyone is in some ways looking away in horror as this air pump is being operated and the uh, bird is, you know, kind of having its last fluttering air, having the air removed. Um, yeah, no one wants to look. Um, yeah, but let me talk first about what is, I think, surprising. And uh, historians of science used to not really pay much attention to this. The 18th century is a tradition to focus just on the biggest philosophers or scientists. So Newton, Boyle, Lavoisier, Laplace. You would just kind of tick off the great names and explore their works. Um, and recently, people have gone back and looked at the record and said, wow, we really missed one of the most interesting things of the 18th century, which is the explosion of public demonstrators and lecturers. So there was kind of an army of followers, mostly of Newton, um, who went out into coffee houses, taverns, assembly rooms, into private homes, like we saw in those previous ones, um, armed with a kind of battery of scientific machines, instruments, um, in order to lecture and demonstrate. Now, part of this was just kind of making a living. A lot of these people, they were charging small amounts. This was a successful way for those that aren't sons of earls to, to do science here. They're also being sponsored by instrument makers, which is a kind of new profession that comes up in England. Uh, there were a couple old, like the glass blowers or spectacle makers and clock makers, but there's an explosion. London by 1800 has, uh, I think something like 350 <coughs> instrument shops, just in scientific instruments. Um, and they're not doing it just for people like Robert Boyle or the cutting edge scientists. They're making hundreds of air pumps, hundreds of orreries, hundreds of mechanical devices. Um, you see a couple here. This philosophical table. This one allows you to do about 70 different experiments with a series of weights and pulleys. And this compound engine is kind of a similar device. Um, what I think is really interesting is two things. One, we had missed how much science became popular through these activities, going out into um, coffee houses. And something like what we're having here today, people would pay a small amount. They usually pay like about a guinea or so um, for a subscription to participate in a lecture series in which someone would come for like four or five weeks with a series of instruments to demonstrate the principles of mechanics, pneumatics, optics, hydrostatics, basically the kind of six big fields of natural science to explain to people um, here. And what's interesting about it is not only the popularity, but it seems to have changed the nature of the science. Like I think there's a common assumption that Newton, who laid down these mathematical laws of motion and mechanics, that it's a clear jump between Newton and the world of factories or machines. But in retrospect, when you look at Newton's writings, it didn't seem like that at all the time. Newton didn't seem to think that what he was writing about in any way applied to machines or to everyday life. And a lot of his ideas, that he had these beautifully elegant equations um, and principles about motion of matter. But who actually translated that into principles of torque, into principles of friction within machines? It turns out it was actually done by all these lecturers. Um, and part of it they were doing is they were trying to sell it to audiences. They were looking at these coffee shops and they are looking at landowners who have mining estates. They are looking at um, owners of ships who are dealing with principles of longitude or cranes. All of these people, that had all these potential investors, and I should point out that coffee houses in the 18th century are kind of the places where business are done. You know, Lloyd's Insurance Company started out as Lloyd's Coffee House. Like the coffee house is the place where you buy stocks, you read the news, and in the 18th century, you attend science lectures. The scientists around there, they're willing to consult with you about whether you should invest in one of these new steam engines for your mine, or someone is selling you a new um, potential engine um, to create tread, or whatever the topic is. These people are kind of um, working out the practical applied aspects of Newton's philosophy. Yeah. Uh, did they have patent laws at that time? Okay, good question. Did they have patent laws at the time? They did those a dramatically different system. You had to receive 
um, a royal patent. So you had to go through a political process here. The Royal Society had hoped actually to take over the patent process. They thought, well, since we're going to get all of these scientists here, why don't we handle that? That was uh, a political hot potato that was quickly taken away. So yeah, um, you can apply. There weren't many. I can't remember the numbers if it's something like 30 a year in Great Britain. They eventually streamline it um, later on and it becomes a much more mechanical process. Yeah. Yes, you can use these patents, um, and some do. Uh, it was a tension within the scientific community. Should knowledge be open and to the public for all, or should one have a proprietary right in knowledge that you spent time and energy creating? And this was one of the potential sources of tension when philosophers tried to work with craftsmen. Because they would look over their shoulder and say, How, tell me all of your secrets of your trade. Right? Uh, and then they're going to write about it in their books to the public um, and others. But, um, so that is a potential tension. But I do think it's really important, these, these lecturers. And you would see them all throughout London, but all throughout the provinces. They're here in America, Philadelphia, New York, Williamsburg, Charlestown. Look at a colonial newspaper in the 18th century, you will find people advertising for these evening classes, public demonstrations, um, all trying to make science accessible and in interesting ways useful to people. They're saying science is going to teach you how to invest your money, how to build machines, um, and also how to talk to each other. Because before, a millwright and another mechanic might not even use the same vocabulary. So to talk about torque, to have a certain set of numbers, to have basic principles um, laid out mathematically and scientifically allows artisans and engineers to talk to each other in ways that they never could before. So science uh, increasingly, sometimes people talk about the industrial enlightenment now. But the 18th century was the kind of first time in which science created a shared vocabulary, a shared interest in machines. Because otherwise, I mean, one of the important things is well, how do you get gentlemen and other groups to want to invest in all of this expensive but potentially um, problematic machinery? So science is really important to that. Yeah. Was, <coughs> pardon me, was the effort and, and the R&D and all that stuff that went in by these gentlemen sponsored by the government, by their own independent wealth, or by these people that made machines? Or... Okay, good question. So was the money being spent into these machines and investments? Now, some of these are models and so forth, or principal um, devices that demonstrate principles. But was money that was put into actual machinery and investment, was that by the government, by other groups? Um, who was paying for the R&D, for this industrial enlightenment, right? Uh, it's mostly private groups. The government offers some bounties and premiums in lieu of an of a actual patent. So when people invent or discover something very useful, like there was a famous salt making technique in the 18th century, they said to the guy, we're going to give you 2,000 pounds as a reward. And we expect you to make it public. There's a famous reward for 20,000 pounds for anyone who would discover longitude. And so a famous clockmaker, um, Harrison, eventually got it. So there are a couple choice moments where the government intervenes. But it's mostly done at the private level here. And that's what I think is one of the things that's really interesting is um, about kind of, uh, let me go back here, um, is about how do you create a culture of innovation where you want people to invest all that money? People were used to doing what their fathers or grandfathers have done in terms of investment. And so I think it's really important to understand how much science, science communicated in coffee houses to the public in this everyday way. It might not be breakthrough science, right? None of these demonstrators are developing great new theories or ideas or techniques, but how much that helped encourage ordinary people to invest. And probably the best way to see it, again, is through a critic's eyes. If any of you have read Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, um, there's a famous scene in there where Gulliver goes to this island of Locuta. And um, the island is basically a parody on Bacon's New Atlantis. So it's an island run by a scientific society of experimenters, but it's a dystopia. Everything is awful in this island. And the reason why it's awful is because it's all these scientists trying to sell people on new machines, new engines, new experimental ways of doing things. And Swift knows how to parody things viciously. So there's like an architect who's doing experiments how to build houses from the top down instead of from the bottom up. So each one is like a ridiculous way. There's another experimenter trying to create a breed of sheep that have no, no, no wool, so naked sheep. You know, why would you want to make it cheap? The point is, is that experimenters don't really add useful benefits to society. They just encourage us to do things differently. Because otherwise, Swift is one of the first of the great critics of science in terms of bemoaning the way it, it leads us to, to reject tradition and prudence and common sense 
in the vision that science will always produce something better and new here. And Edmund Burke takes up the same theme, the great conservative, when he attacks the French Revolution and others. So, but anyway, so Swift's, his whole parody is about investors being basically, the, the science creates bubbles of enthusiastic investment that never pays the returns. And that's very much a, a message from the 18th century when people were investing so much in, in science and technology. Yeah. I'm also thinking about Mary Shelley and uh, Frankenstein and right. the popular reaction to, to science maybe being a dark art almost. Okay. So the question, yeah, you were thinking about, uh, and you're well to think about uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein um, and the idea about science as a dark art. I often think about that when I look at this image here. About the, the, and I think one of the things it plays on is this theme about the dividing line between life and death as a line that science should not potentially cross. Um, and that's one of the big messages of Shelley's Frankenstein, although it's a, it's a really interesting and complicated text. Um, so there is a growing critique among the Romantic generation that will follow this 18th century that, that do view um, science as either, and they're two opposite visions, but either um, taking all of the spirit and uniqueness out of the world, kind of um, Max Weber had a famous phrase, the uh, disenchanting of the world. Um, and I think Shelley the poet said, like, a scientist would clip an angel's wings if he saw them. So there's a sense that science kind of takes all the mystery and love and emotion out of the world. And on the second hand is this critique that science is also kind of practiced, dabbles in the dark arts. That science does kind of um, uh, play with life and death in ways that are morally unconscionable. And so both of those kind of critiques come up a little bit later on. Like I said, the 18th century is kind of the heyday of public science, um, but it does produce a backlash among people. None of these things are, are seen, and I think that goes to the heart of experimentation. What are you doing when you force nature out of its normal path into a different path that you want to study or the things you want to create? And so there's some ambivalence. People celebrate experimentalism as a culture, but they're also concerned that it could lead in morally questionable ways, or it could lead to a world in which everyone is just a cult of innovation. So try something new just for the sake of new here. Um, let me just skip ahead here, because I, I do want to kind of end, and I should say there's a lot of these public spectacles too, where they have these famous demonstrations where they try to prove different theories. The public gets invited to witness, and in some ways even judge things, so whether it's Franklin, you probably know Franklin in his kite experiment, right? Like, it's not an accident, he wasn't out there flying kite and struck by lightning. It was a, it was a purposeful experiment to prove his theory that lightning was electricity. Yeah, there was another experiment that was done later about whether pointed rods or tipped rods would be the best for lightning, um, for creating lightning rods. And so in England, at the, at the big public arsenal, they had this big display where like 500 people watched as they zapped these different rods. And Lavoisier's famous experiments that he did um, in terms of chemistry. All of these were done in public. I'm going to move ahead of here. Ballooning. Lots of fun with pneumatics. Um, oh yeah, I had to put this in here, this slide. Um, electricity was another thing. I've been focusing mostly on pneumatics, but electricity was this new science, and electric gardening was a new thing that people pushed. And this is where like Swift and others were like, you're going too far. But basically, people, every new discovery, whether it's magnetism, electricity, pneumatics, let's create new fields of medicine, new fields of agriculture, new fields of manufacturing using these new principles. Electrified garden. Yeah. But let me end, actually, uh, here, and I'll just take one minute with, um, not with Shelley and Frankenstein, but with a much kinder view to science, which is Maria Edgeworth. The most, one of the most popular, maybe the most popular children's series of the early 19th century was a series called Harry and Lucy. Uh, it was four volumes. It printed all the time in America. They came out with basic copies of them where they changed the names to like Charlotte and Steve, I think. Something like that. Um, but at the heart of this series are two clucky kids who learn about the world through experimentation. Yeah. Um, so they learn, the book starts off with them, the whole first volume, in fact, is pneumatic. So they learn about barometers and thermometers, and they get to play with an air pump. And it, it spawned wide kind of um, imitations all throughout the 18th century. But I think it's really interesting, um, let me pull up the quote. Here. This is something I would definitely recommend, if any of you are interested, read about it, because it's this very sentimental, very interesting view about how children need to be engaged in the world. Their imagination needs to be fired. And the best way to do that is experimentation. Here. So science actually becomes, for much of the 19th century, at the heart of children's education. There's this quote by Locke that I'll end on here. 
Uh, this is on the cover piece here, this quote, which sums up their view. The business of education and respective knowledge is not, as I think, to perfect a learner in all or any of the sciences, but to give his mind the disposition and those habits that may enable him to attain any part of knowledge he shall stand in need of in the future course of his life. We want to train active learners, people who know how to pose questions, know how to think. And how do you do that by the early 19th century? It's experimentation. The book is all about experiments, that kids get to know how to think, how to be skeptical, how to pose questions. Um, that their fundamental character and their mind is shaped by experiments, and that's, that's a good thing. And that's a very different place than we started out with in 1650. So, all right, so I'll end there, and then uh, next week we'll talk about quantification.